Actually, my next guest needs absolutely no introduction. He is a man. He is a myth. He is a legend. He is playing with the microphone. There's a reason. <laughs> I, we had, you know John Joseph? Of the Cro-Mags. Oh, my God. He's Rich Roll's uh, number one most favored uh, interview. And he was in Detroit rocking out punk vegan music. And, man, I just watched him just rock it. I just wanted to do it once. John Joseph, I love you. And with that, we welcome Dr. Joel Kahn to the show. <laughs> welcome, my friend. Thanks for being here. You bet. You bet. Uh, we are at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. That 2019 edition. How's it been treating you so far? I thought we were like at a Cordon Bleu chef course because we just <laughs> had the most amazing plant-based oil-free meal. It's, you know, I've gone to medical meetings my whole life. It's amazing that this stands out with just a little extra effort at a hotel, what yeah. they can do. So meetings been great. It's always, I love, it's top level science. I love seeing people. I right love on. seeing people wear amazing shirt and ties. You're my but, guy. You know, show me new science from academic centers. Best stuff. Just hey. screws me up. Hold on. You're pure energy, man. Like, I, I like you. We can shuck and jive during this interview. <laughs> it's none of that stuff oh. either. That's That would be sprout dust. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I'll do a line of sprout dust. Brussels sprout snuff. That's right. All right. Uh, so We're brussling, brussling. <laughs> DrJoelKahn.com is where people can find you. Um, recently, you've been talking a lot about red meat, and I know that you have three reasons now why people shouldn't be eating red meat. We've heard a lot about them in the past. I'm curious to get your take on it. Thank red you. Meat. And I'm interviewing right now for Neil Bernard so that I can get on stage next year and give the five new reasons because there'll be more by next year. But <laughs> reason number one, everybody write this down, four letters, T-M-A-O. And I'm really quick. In the last eight years, science out of the Cleveland Clinic and now all over the world, if you eat red meat, it has an amino acid called L-carnitine. doesn't matter if it's grass-fed or it's grain-fed, it has L-carnitine. And if you eat an egg yolk, it has choline. When it gets in your gut, if you're an average American, it causes the production of a chemical nobody talked about 10 years ago, TMAO. There's now a routine blood test I do in my heart clinic in Detroit, and I can measure the blood level through Quest Labs. The point is, it actually promotes hardening of the arteries and it promotes clumping of the blood. And if you have hardened arteries and clumped blood, you're having a stroke or a heart attack. So TMAO has become a big deal. That's where it comes from, red meat and egg yolk. It's mm -hmm. like the vegan docs designed this molecule to uh, educate the public. It's not the case, it's our physiology. Interestingly, if you're a plant-based person and you get paid to eat a steak for a research project, you don't make this molecule because your gut doesn't know what to do with it. We got an advantage. Right, right. This week, here's reason number one. They did a randomized study in Australia. 45 people put on the Paleolithic diet. It's still hot, although it's fading a little. A lot of meat, a lot of greens, a lot of berries. It's not junk food, so it's better than junk food, but it's a lot of meat. And they put them on a standard Australian diet. TMAO levels very high on the paleo diet. Now, mm -hmm. the paleo authors, the paleo doctors, the paleo food producers aren't going to blast that. It was blasted all over the world news. It's just one more reason to consider these new trendy diets like the paleo diet that you know 10 to 15 years of uh, headline news for the paleo diet bad idea you know the berries and the greens great the right. increased red meat doesn't matter grass-fed doesn't matter grain-fed doesn't matter organic it's in the red meat that's uh, reason number one i would assume atkins and keto kind of the same principles would sure apply there. Yeah. sure they weren't the source of the diet described sure, in this recent sure. study absolutely if yeah. you're eating a ribeye and calling it the carnivore diet the keto diet you're definitely going to expose you to this atherosclerosis you know these diets are new heart disease and cancer can take 10 to 20 years to come up into your life. If you've been doing keto for a year, you have no idea what you're doing to your risk. You right. know, in my opinion, you're jacked up your risk of cancer and heart disease a lot. So, number one. You want to go to number two? Yeah, let's go, man. Number two is like wild. Number two reason not to eat red meat is a red meat allergy. If you've been reading the headlines, the last two years, there's a tick that was first described in the state of Virginia, the Lone Star Tick, because of a little mark on its back. Looks a little bit like the, the Lone state Star. Of Texas. Yeah, you the would think Lone Texas, but here Star it is Texas. Virginia, my home state. They did a study that if you're in the hospital in Virginia, University of Virginia, Charlottesville, 24% of people had an antibody from having been bit by the Lone Star Tick. It doesn't cause Lyme disease. But again, talk about this unbelievable scientific tidbit. That antibody from having been bit by the tick cross-reacts with red meat. No kidding. And what does it cross-react with? There's actually a carbohydrate in red meat. It's not all fat and protein. Little tiny bit called alpha-gal. Immunologists, allergists know what this is. 
the next time you eat a burger after being bit, the next time you have a hot dog, the next time you have a steak, your eyes are itching, your nose is running, you're scratching, you start to wheeze. You can have anaphylactic shock from eating red meat after the tick bite. But 24%, that's like huge numbers. Wow. People in Virginia have EpiPens and a little bracelet that says red meat allergy. So in the past few years, it's all the way up to Maine. It's all the way up to Minnesota. It's actually now in the state of Texas. We brought the Lone Star Tick to the Lone Star State. It's actually, I feel badly for the people that have that. It's as serious as a nut allergy. Yeah. They're going to announce on Delta Airlines soon. We have a red meat allergy person. You can't eat red meat on our flight. No nope. Maybe. But um, it's a real serious medical problem. Wow. So just don't eat red meat. Haven't even heard of that one yet. Yeah, yeah. it's actually like a large body of science. Alpha gal is the carbohydrate meat. And uh, allergists have been dealing with it, but it's increasing in frequency. Okay. I don't wish ill on people, but we, you know, we have to recognize the science is there. And number three? Yeah, go for it. This is like insane. So it turns out on the membrane of our cells, this is like the kind of science we talk about here. There's a carbohydrate called NU5AC, N-E-U. This is new science and this is NU5AC, N-E-U, 5AC. We are one of the only mammals on the planet that can't take that molecule, and there's an enzyme, and turn it into something called NU5GC. So when we're babies, we have no NU5GC. Where do you find NU5GC? In cow meat, in red meat. So there's a molecule in red meat we've never seen when we're born. What happens to foreign molecules? We make antibodies to them. We think it's an invader. Right. You know, no cow would think it's an invader. We think it's an sure, invader. Sure, sure. These antibodies have been described in the last few years to actually attack our arteries. And part of the injury, it's smoking, it's blood pressure, it's blood sugar, it's right. the diet, it's a lack of exercise, it's genetic. Part of the injury may be red meat, triggers an antibody, goes right back to the artery, and calls xenocellitis. That's a word nobody's heard of. Yeah, say that yeah. three times fast. Xenocellitis, xenocellitis, xenocellitis. <laughs> but um, this is actually in the news this week. Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. This is like the premier heavy science article that uh, more and more data says red meat introduces a foreign object. What's your choice? Sure, they're going to try and come up with a drug that blocks it or a vitamin that blocks it. Mm -hmm. Don't eat red meat. So, number one, TMAO. Number two, tick. Lone Star Tick. Number three, new 5 GC, we're just not built to eat certainly a lot of red meat. You could argue in 2019, we're not built to eat red meat. No. So those are definitely three new reasons not to eat red meat. I, yeah, I, you know, really we can talk about no fiber. We can talk about no vitamin C. We can talk about high saturated fat. Uh, we can talk about it slows down your colon transit and increases your risk of cancer or causes cancer if you process red meat. But these are three new ones that have just been in headlines. And, you know, I have declared 2019 the year to be uh, not a butcher. It's a really bad year to be a butcher. Now, in your practice, when you're working with patients and you share this type of information with them, is their mind just kind of blown? Like, I've been eating red meat my entire life and I had no idea. Yeah, they, you know, I try and be gentle with them, but um, I gauge it on the degree of diabetes, heart disease, cancer risk they're at. But I give them the science. As you know, I don't have skin in the game. That's one of the most frequent arguments is, don't listen to that guy. He's a vegan doctor. Don't listen to Dr. Garth Davis. Don't listen to Dr. Neil Barnard. These guys are so biased. And why do we do this? Because we read the science, we see the health problems as medical doctors, we see the improvement that occurs and turns around, the prevention, yeah. the reversal. And so I'm very much just an advocate for my patient's health, and I will just lay it out for them. You know, you can put your head in the sand all you want, but you're going to pay the price most likely. I think it's important for people to realize that the majority of people who are plant-based didn't start off plant-based. Nor it did was I. that research that, that brought them to that decision, like, hey, I should probably get on board this train. Do you remember what specific research it was that was that aha moment for you? Well, you know, I was delivered by a stork, so there was an animal involved right at the beginning, yeah, and that's right. I actually adopted a plant-based diet at age 18. It was because of, it's a very emotional story, horrible dorm food at Ann Arbor University of Michigan. It's 42 years later. But it was, for me, the first thing was the, the book Diet for a New America by John Robbins. It was part science, part environment, part animal rights. I read it about age 24, and it really made a profound difference. And then 1990, Dr. Dean Ornish, that just sealed the deal. Because yeah. here I had something to start, 1990, I started cardiology practice. Oh my God, thank you, you know, for the gift of now I have something to teach every parent.
patient, even though I was putting stents, treating heart attacks, three in the morning, I had something to teach him that I didn't need to see him again and basically worked myself out of a job because my patients eat better than average and they're educated. Hey, but you know what? You're true to your practice, though. Yeah, no, you got to do it. And there's a whole lot of people that still need to be seen, and I still see patients. Yeah. How much progress have you noticed as a doctor in those what, three decades now uh, since you've been practicing as far as people's openness and acceptance of plant-based diets? Well, I'd say hospital administrators, uh, 1% are not brain dead. 99% brain dead hospital administrators. I walk into Harper University Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Wendy's is the first thing you see when you walk into University Hospital. Yikes. It's been there for years so I can get the Baconator burger and the Baconator fries with a Pepsi. Mmm, that's good. It's terrible. And now we have got a burger joint in the other hospital that I practice at. So hospital CEOs, 1% to 2% have both the scientific, moral, and ethical backbone to say it's just wrong. And, you know, PCRM has been huge at pressuring uh, many places to close and reopen as a healthier version. Medical world, it's, the, it's better than that, you know, yeah. because you get to be 50, 60 years old as a doctor. You're looking tired, you're feeling tired, nothing below the waist is working, nothing above the neck is working all that well. That's when they are looking for solutions and they might actually start to eat better. But they're gonna say, I eat chicken instead of red meat. Sure. And recent science in the last couple months said that's now better for your heart and your cholesterol. Um, it may be different for the red meat allergy issue, but it's no better for your cholesterol. The thing that blows my mind about having restaurants like that in hospitals is that you don't have to be a doctor. You, have, you don't have to know a whole lot about nutrition to know that yeah. fast food isn't healthy for you. And you go to a hospital to get well. So yeah. why then would you be serving this at a place that you go to get fixed? Just Let me just for a minute just act like a hospital administrator. Mm. That's the only reason. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. And just those are a lot of singles. <laughs> um, that is the only reason. There can't be another reason. Because you're right. That's too obvious. I mean, I'm actually developing, you don't know this, a, a crystal meth delivery program for hospital patients. A crystal yeah, meth? Yeah, you're in bed. You want your crystal meth. Why not? I mean, I'll give you a bacon. It's just as bad. So it's literally, it's, I'm being cruel because this has been a passion of mine aligned with PCRM. I have a Facebook page. I think it's the only Facebook page in the world that protests hospital food and bacon at hospitals every day. I post every day because there's plenty of data since the World Health Organization announced October 24, 2015. You know, processed red meat causes cancer. Should have been game done. Yeah. Every hospital should have said, ethically, we're stopping. And the Cleveland Clinic got this close till their employees pushed back hard enough that they gave up. You know, and, you know, it's funny, we talked about that on the show, and I'll never forget this this tweet that I got from somebody who was, like, just so furious that we did a show talking about the, you know, health risks associated with eating bacon. And, you know, we, we talked about the World Health Organization, and, and somebody sent this tweet, and they were like, what does the World Health Organization know? They're wrong about everything. And I'm just like... I, I don't know where to go with this. Yeah, you don't. You know, the, just because I know it, that was a heavily researched declaration, uh, October 2015, uh, 22 eminent scientists and over 800 research papers reviewed. Now, if you're an academic physician, you may have some conflicts. You may do pharmaceutical studies. You may get funding from the egg board or the dairy board. I mean, it's real life academics and all, but this was not people that had you know skin in the game. There may have been a vegan on the panel. That's often... Uh, a stone cast because that vegan scientist actually read the literature made a personal decision mm -hmm. just as I mentioned before yeah but no um, there has only been growing data since 2015 that that was a accurate declaration so it's firmer and firmer in the scientific world as I said really bad year to be a butcher 2019 and I think that even if there was a vegan on that panel it's important for people to realize that yes it is possible for human beings to check their bias and present something independently because right. otherwise no meat-eating scientist could ever comment on nutrition which is going to be 95 percent of scientists let's play it right back in their face it's not fair and I do that as frequently as I can because uh, you know just eliminate that conversation let's look at the data all right so we talked about the fast food restaurants and hospitals but you have a, a restaurant of your own do you not yeah working very hard in Detroit green space cafe and another one called green space and go whole food plant-based one very large and one smaller uh, family project with my very hard-working son Daniel and my very hard-working wife Karen you know the passion 
I saw it in LA, I saw it in New York. I just couldn't find it in Detroit. We had nice small restaurants. So uh, we put, I said, I put my money where your mouth is. I call it 401k cafe, the whole thing. It's a hard business. And frankly, the Beyond Meat Burger and Impossible Burger have changed the dynamic because 35,000 restaurants have a plant-based burger option, not whole food plant-based, right, but right. plant-based. And it's uh, changed uh, you know, where people are eating. It can be the local bar now. So uh, we're just up in our game to go healthier. Yeah, and I'm curious to get your opinion. I've asked Dr. Barnard about this in the past, his opinion on the Impossible Burger Beyond Meat. And he said, it's good, but it's like methadone as far as like you're just kind of it's a gradual step to get off of that drug, you know? Yeah, right. And so it's it's a step. Let's not stay there. Let's yeah. get better. I agree What's with that. It's a transition point. You yeah. know, um, I think in the net picture, number one, undoubtedly for animals, better. Undoubtedly for the environment, better. Uh, undoubtedly for investors, way better. Have you seen <laughs> Which, the stock? Uh, not. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. And now, now they're talking that their next product is uh, Beyond Meat Bacon, and there's going to be fish products this year. There already are by wonderful chefs like Chad and Derek Sarno. Um, and chicken products are out there, but they're getting better and better. I hope they do lead ultimately to versions that are a little closer to whole food and a little lower in added oils. But... Um, I am very restrictive with my patients if they have advanced heart disease. Advanced heart disease, no deal. Hands off, you're eating fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains without added oil, without added sugar. But for those that are just transitioning for a variety of reasons, it's going to make it more comfortable. And now that you can literally on a road trip, where you might have said before, there's nothing here but the barbecue joint, and I'm going to go back to my old style. Yeah. You can't make that excuse anymore with Burger King and with Carl's Jr. and with Red Robin and all the others. There's a plant-based burger waiting for you, Tim Horton in you know, a White Castle around the corner. Just skip the cheese, skip the mayo, skip the bun, the bun juicy. Probably more. skip the plastic wrapping. That's more toxic than yeah, the right. whole deal. <laughs> eat, eat the patty with a, a lettuce and a tomato. You, you're not that bad off. Right. Um, you, you mentioned it's, it's some of your your patients who may be in a little bit more rough shape. You know, their diet is a little bit more restrictive. How do you get them to adhere to that? Fear of death? No, That's seriously. A powerful I, I'm being honest. As a cardiologist, people, you know, the the king of this appropriately is Dr. Esselstyn, and he still runs a seminar once a month on a Friday in Cleveland. God bless him at his age with his energy, but his energy is high. But people do seek me out. I'm supposed to have bypass, supposed to have a stand. I had a heart attack. They've already located that there's a true source here, and they've got to do it. They try and negotiate it, but look, there is no oil. There is no processed. It's not Beyond Meat Burger. It's you know plenty of recipes, and it's not hard to do. And truly, many of them, three, four weeks, just like Dr. Ornish wrote about in 1990. Actually, he wrote in 1983, just like Dr. Eston wrote about in about 1990. In 1995, they feel better in three, four weeks. Their yep. stress does it better. So they're locked in. They get it. And they get evangelistic about it, which is just great. Um, if they're not in trouble, you know, you have to pick the size of the tool for the size of the problem. Right. Uh, what Dr. Ornish called the spectrum. You know, really sick, really intense diet. Going for general health, you know, there's a little more wiggle room. It's not into the meat and dairy, but uh, once in a while... A veggie pizza on the run, a veggie cheeses pizza is you know not going to hurt an average public member. And and let's let's finish with this question. As a doctor, I mean, when you see this turnaround after those three or four weeks, and the patient has gone all in on this, and you're seeing them maybe come off of some of their medicine and their symptoms just right. kind of fall away, that has to be pretty rewarding for you. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable what some people can achieve actually on their own. I mean, doc. I'm here today, but two months ago I read this, I watched this, and I started that diet. And the 28-pound weight loss and the blood sugar, blood pressure, the chest pain, the shortness of breath, it's really remarkable uh, how much this is self-care, how much this is watching Forks Over Knives. I have dozens of copies of Dr. Neil Bernard's program for reversing diabetes, That the new white copy, not the old blue copy that uh, patients walk out with, Dr. Asselstyn, my own books. And it's really, it's some self-study. Now, if they're on a lot of medication, there should be a doctor guides them as they hopefully sure. can back sure, off. Sure. Some people hit a roadblock. The weight won't come off, and we got to look deeper into sleep and stress and um, hormonal levels and some stuff. But for most people, that's a miracle. Something more powerful than drugs can be administered at home.
in your refrigerator, your pantry, your farmer's market, your produce department. Been there their whole lives. They just didn't realize. Uh, I think somebody kind of did that I'm sitting next to. <laughs> Dr. Joel Kahn. People can find you at drjoelkahn.com. I assume you're a social media guy as well? No. I mean, no? I'm going to get on social media after I get With uh, your... Per- come on. A, <laughs> about it. There is no uh, way with your personality I, I, you're I, not I, on the I reach, I reach a million people a week on social My media. Man, that's so, what I'm talking about. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. All of them. Dr. Cool. J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N. Dr. Joe Kahn, man, you are welcome back on this show anytime, my man. Thank you, buddy. Cool.